I was asked to discuss, uh, so this is the sort of underlying question for this session, right? Does social protection research help the most vulnerable? Um, what are some examples of evidence uptake and what are some of the key ingredients or challenges to evidence uptake? What I'm going to do is actually, um, so as Marie mentioned in the intro, uh, I've been part of the transfer project, which has been a kind of a regional uh, learning initiative to, to study cash transfers, national cash transfer programs in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about are going to be experiences that we gleaned, that we learned as we um, developed this, this kind of research agenda and this, this model, if you will, of evidence to action. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually is, comes from this book that we, that we wrote, which gives, actually responds exactly to the prompt in this session, which is um, we took eight country studies where we did evaluations of national programs, and we brought together the implementers, um, the evaluators, and the donors, and asked them to write about how the evidence um, was used, right? And in fact, in the Malawi chapter, uh, me and Esme are co-authors along with a whole bunch of other people, and um, you know, we rolled up our sleeves and really talked about what the evidence meant to each of the you know, parties and try to make it coherent. So um, if you like what I say, then I'll invite you to, to take a look at this book. Um, if you don't have time and don't read books anymore, because that's the life we live in, there's a blog about it. And so there's the blog site, and that's the website. And if you're impressed with the blog, then maybe you'll pick up the book. But again, it's not a typical book. It's more about you know, the evidence to uptake um, issue rather than just you know, hear the impacts. OK. So let me um, give you a couple of highlights. There's so much stuff in this book, right, about evidence to uptake. But let me give you a couple of, of key kind of you know, juicy you know, ingredients. Marie wanted ingredients, right? So, um, so here are a couple of them. And then I'll give you some examples. I have three examples for you. One has to do with the relationship between the evaluator and the implementer, right? Um, and so here, the issue, of course, is the one of trust and ensuring that both parties understand that they are you know, on the same team, that they have the same objective. And here in the book, we really uh, take a, we really try and um, unpack, if you will, this idea of an arm's length evaluation. And, and really, our position is that you know, if I was arm's length to Esme, um, we probably wouldn't have gotten anything done because she wouldn't have trusted me and I would never have interacted with her, right? We needed to be part of the same team. And so it really, it, it's helpful to, for us to be a little bit critical of this idea of arm's length and what we mean by arm's length, all right? Um, that's the first thing. Second thing is that um, embedding the impact evaluation into a broader learning agenda was crucial for us, all right? And you know, first of all, we can't wait to, most policymakers and implementers don't want to wait two years for the first set of results of an impact evaluation. Secondly, there's so much more information and evidence that can be brought to bear to make a program work beyond just the impact per se, right? And understanding that whole host of questions and then doing the studies, the you know, kind of um, satellite or um, parallel studies was really useful in moving the agenda. It also meant that there were more occasions to bring together all the stakeholders to discuss results instead of waiting for the big you know, impact results in two years. So that's another key message, and I'll show you some examples of that. And then finally, um, for us, what was very key was the partnership with national researchers. And you know, this has been discussed already today, but one of the things that really, where it really mattered was that when we, had a, you know, when we had a strong research partner based in the country, they were always available at a moment's notice to present results, okay? There's a meeting, there's a cabinet meeting, we want to prepare something, or no, there's some, you know, some emergency, boom, someone is there from the evaluation team, right? Um, and that, that, that piece of it may be overlooked, right? Um, 
but t turns out to be really important. So let's get to some of the uh, examples quickly here. Okay, so the first one is the Ghana LEAP cash transfer. And here, so again, this is the initial impact evalu evaluation was in 2010 to 2012. It was partially funded by 3IE through their open window. Um, and here, what happened, and this is an example where actually the impact evaluation itself sort of was a conduit to a, a more detailed kind of exploration of the operational issues around the LEAP program. And what we showed right from the beginning at the baseline was that the transfer value was way too low to have an impact. Um, so in fact, this I went back into the archives and this was the, the baseline workshop and this was a PowerPoint. This is literally the PowerPoint that we showed at the 2011 baseline workshop in Akosambo. And uh, here we show that you know, this is the, the transfer share um, in Ghana in the LEAP program and then here's, you know, some comparable programs, cash transfer. So, for example, in Mexico, the Progresa, you know, was transferring about 23% of the beneficiary's consumption. Colombia, around 25%. And Ghana was down 7%. We said, look, there's no way this program is going to have an impact because the transfer is just too low. Based on that, on, literally on this graph, the transfer value was tripled in the country and just based on the baseline results, right? So, the, so here again, we didn't have to wait two years. We had rich baseline information. We used it, and we were able to show that there were some issues already that could be taken care of. When we got to the end line in 2012, there were no results. There were no impacts of the program, and we dug a little deeper, and we found out that we got from the administrative database the payment schedules. And these are the payment schedules during the, the evaluation. And you could see that payments were not predictable, right? And so essentially, um, a key assumption of the log frame was, did not hold. And that assumption in the log, the log frame of the program was that transfer will be delivered in a timely and predictable manner. They were not. Okay? And this again led to um, a lot of changes within the program in terms of the you know, efficiently and timely delivery of um, of benefit. So, again, this is an interesting case where all the results were kind of negative and yet we had such important influence in terms of changing the program, right? And I think, again, that the evaluation was a, a mechanism for us to raise these other issues. Um, second example is Zambia. Um, so, again, here there was a big evaluation of a whole series of cash transfer <laughs> programs. Um, and here I want to highlight something very interesting, which was at the very initial meeting between the team and the, um, and the ministry, the ministry was very clear and they said, look, we, you know, we need to really show or debunk myths around cash transfers, okay, in which, and this is what is blocking us from being able to scale up the program, and those are the classic myths about cash transfers being, you know, leading to dependency, leading to laziness or a handout, a waste of money, people are going to waste the money and so on. And so they said, look, we understand that, you know, the log frame doesn't include these economic and productive indicators, but those are the outcomes that we need to emphasize in the evaluation. So you had a situation where we were going to evaluate a program and of course we were going to include the usual stuff, right? the health and education consumption, but actually what they wanted was the non-log frame indicators because those are the ones that, was gonna, that were going to be influential in the scale-up. So I think, again, you know, that trust with the team and the, and the ministry, understanding what they needed, understanding the objective of the evaluation is what made this a really big success. Um, I'm probably running out, I'm going to run out of time eventually, so I have to skip some of this stuff. But here I thought, um, this is kind of like the timeline in Zambia of the different evaluations and their timing, the baseline and the follow-ups. And the green line is sort of the scale-up of the program. And what happened in Zambia was the ministry had a really purposeful dissemination strategy. They had lots of dissemination events. They focused on the productive um, effects rather than you know, the social effects. And you could see 
sort of what happened in terms of the scale up to the extent that at the time about six million dollars were spent on this evaluation and that was very controversial, okay? Um, but look, sort of the effect of that was that actually it leveraged, you know, way more money than that in per perpetuity basically. Well, we know that Zambia has some issues right now um, in terms of the cash transfer, but look at the leverage of that evaluation money in terms of the government funds, right, to scale up. Um, and then in the 2016 election, uh, Lungu ran, you know, this was a billboard during the election cycle in Lusaka. And can you imagine 10 years ago, Manny was talking about, you know, what was life like 10 years ago? 10 years ago, would you have imagined that, a, that an African, you know, a, in an election in Sub-Saharan Africa, a platform of social protection would be part of, you know, the candidate's platform, right? It's unbelievable. This happened in the last Kenyan election, too. Uhuru Kenyatta had a platform of sort of universal child rent. So um, really big, big changes in the last 10 years in terms of cash transfers. All right, let's move to the exciting case of Malawi because we have Esme here. Um, so let's see if we can uh, incite some, you know, discussion. Um, so the Malawi is a very interesting case now. Um, there was an initial evaluation in 2006-07 when the cash transfer was just piloted. Based on those initial results, there was a minor expansion of the program into about eight new districts. However, in, a, in this period of 2008 to 2012, there was really no kind of expansion or dynamism. The program was basically just kind of lying around. It was a period of stagnation. And at that time, if you had asked us, we would have said that the evaluation was a failure in the sense that there was no uptake of the evidence, okay? But actually what was going on was that that evidence continued to be brought out as necessary. It provided very important information and input into a national social protection policy. And in 2012, there was kind of like a takeoff, a new life was you know, based on this policy, based on the continued repetition of those results for over the last four years, suddenly donors came on board, the government put in some money, and the program scaled up. And Esme can tell us a bit more about that, but now the program is in all the districts, uh, over 100,000 households, close to 10% of the population is being reached, amazing. But back then, if you had asked us, we would have said, oh, you know, we would have written off Malawi basically in 2010, right? So I think the lesson here is um, the path is nonlinear. You have to be patient. And, you know, sometimes it takes a while, right? Um, a couple of other maybe um, interesting things on, the, on Malawi. So part of the, you know, as in this 2012 resurrection, if you will, this um, takeoff, there was a new evaluation. Um, and that one, part of it was funded through this, what Marie said with this, this uh, SPTW, right? The Social Protection Thematic Window of 3IE. Um, that evaluation showed very strong positive results. Um, and I think a number of things, and Esme will give her perspective on, on the impact of, and the, the uptake of that evidence. But from my point of view, um, I think it demonstrated that the ministry could implement the program, okay? There has always been questions about the ministry's capacity to, to implement this program at scale. And, and so seeing these strong results and the strong results around targeting and other features of the program really demonstrated the ministry was serious and professional. The fact that they had all this evidence that no other ministry had also demonstrated a sort of seriousness about, about um, their work. The donor's enthusiasm was maintained as a result of the strong kind of things. That's very important in Malawi. But then finally, kind of the thing that this is gonna be a little controversial, is that at the same time, the government itself was putting money into the FISP, right? The, the Fertilizer Input Subsidy Program, a very controversial program. And the World Bank had a big loan, which was sort of going, going on for 15 years, the, the, the public works, the MASAF, right? And around the same time, and so here we, here we had the social cash transfer, which was, showed amazing results. The government was putting money in the FISP. The World Bank was putting money in the public <laughs> works. 
At the same time, Bank did a study on the MASAF and showed actual like negative results of the public works program. At the same time that we came out with the impact results of, this, of the social cash transfer. So there was like this sudden shift, like this seismic shift in Malawi where suddenly the bank said, we're done with the MASAF and they started putting all the money into the cash transfer program. And again, it's, it's quite important in Malawi because of the budget, the fiscal constraints that the donor funding is actually quite important. Um, and this led to the scale up now that we see it in Malawi. So again, it's very non-linear, right? A lot of things going on. I have like zero time, right? <laughs> Negative time, okay. Um, I have to show pictures, so we have pictures. You can't deny the pictures. Right? There's Malawi. But the, thousand words, thousand words. <laughs> and you see the fingerprints, most folks are illiterate. Um, all right, can I, let me wrap up. So what's, what are the, the ingredients, you know, the garlic and the ginger and the cumin? Um, so again, in, in Ghana, the actual impact results were negative, but it generated a discussion about other parts of the program, the operations that led to significant changes and improvements. In Zambia, is a different story. In Zambia, the ministry really knew what they wanted. Right? They said, we want this, and it was not on the log frame, but this is what they want. They demanded it, and they had a strategy for disseminating, and that, that you know, had a big impact on scale up. In Malawi, it was, the path has been very nonlinear. Right? It's been slow, it's taken time, but evidence has played a crucial role. It's always been there, okay? and I think that's important. That's what a key lesson, which is that you know, you'll get dinged. The evidence may not seem to to, to matter, but you get dinged if you don't have the evidence, right? And that's the key. Um, so here's some kind of broad ideas. I think maybe the one that I'll stress, and again, you can read about these in the book, in the book is that is really this idea of patience, okay? Which is that, um, you, you know, the path again is unpredictable, but the evidence in the end you know, if you have that faith and you keep, I keep saying it's like a bicycle, you have to keep pedaling, right? You have to keep pedaling the evidence, otherwise you fall off. Eventually, I think, it does pay off, right? It's just that, again, like I said, it may not be direct and automatic and immediate. So, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.